Welcome. My name is Martina Polasek, and I'm Deputy Secretary General at the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID. I'm very grateful to the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration for the opportunity to speak to you today. At ICSID, we very much value our longstanding cooperation with the SCIA, and we are committed to promoting investor state dispute settlement and providing training opportunities to practitioners and businesses in the region. Today, I'm pleased and honored to be kicking off the SCIA International Arbitration Observatory by presenting to you the revised 2022 exit rules. Our rules revisions are comprehensive and knowing how to apply the 2022 rules is very important to conducting a successful proce procedure. So that is my goal today, to brief you about the main changes in our rules so that you know what to expect and how to apply them. I hope that this will be instructive and I encourage you to email me if you have any questions. First, I'd like to say that I'm thrilled to be finally applying the revised rules. Uh, they entered into force on July the 1st and we already registered a few cases under the new rules and really excited to see them put into action. It's been a long process. We went through six working papers and had extensive consultations before the rules were uh, approved by our member states earlier this year. There was an enormous interest by all of our users, uh, states and investors and uh, council and arbitrators and we received many comments, which is why it took so long. And it's really key to ensure that we have a set of rules that provide for a fair process that both parties have confidence in. And we've been trying to steer the ship with that in mind. We also try to pro provide for a really transparent uh, process. So you have all of the working papers uh, published on our website, uh, including all of the public comments. Now, the first important thing to mention uh, about the objectives of our amendment process is the overriding goal uh, to modernize the process and ensure that it stays fit for purpose over the next, next decade, and also to maintain the strengths, the strengths of the, the existing system. We have incorporated many of the best practices and lessons we have learned in case administration uh, and we also responded to some of the concerns raised in the public discussions on reform of investor state dispute settlement. Our main objectives, uh, you see them here on this uh, slide. Uh, one is to offer a broader range of dispute resolution options. So among other things, we now offer uh, mediation and we have a set of mediation rules. Uh, the second is to achieve greater efficiency and maintaining procedure balance. Uh, and there are many provisions addressing that. Uh, we are also increasing uh, transparency. Uh, so publishing orders and decisions with redactions agreed by the parties. And we're also strengthening provisions to avoid conflicts of interest. And the main provision of note here is our provision on third party funding that I will speak about later. Now, sometimes we had to make compromises between different positions. For instance, on transparency, we didn't go as far as the Institutional Transparency Rules because not everybody wanted full transparency, but we did arrive close to consensus on most topics. And it wasn't just to reflect state consensus, it was really based on consultations with all the users. Now the process led to a complete overhaul of the arbitration and conciliation rules for exit convention and additional facility uh, proceedings. But we also have a completely overhauled fact-finding rules and uh, new mediation rules and you can find them in four different booklets that you see on this slide. 
and they are in searchable format on our website. So uh, you can uh, search by topic or uh, by table of contents, and they will also very soon be available in hard copy format. Now, there is no markup between the 2006 rules and the 2022 rules because we changed so much that it wouldn't be practicable. You wouldn't be able to tell what has changed from that markup because everything would be read. Uh, but we will soon also be issuing a rule by rule commentary uh, with the main changes and what is new. Uh, so look, at, look out for that on our website. Now, today I will be focusing on the arbitration rules under the ICSID Convention um, to tell you about those changes. Uh, and you may wish to have those um, at handy because I will be referring to specific provisions. So you would go to the uh, Convention Regulations and Rules booklet, uh, the blue booklet in this case. First, you might be wondering, what cases do the, these new rules apply to? They don't apply to all pending cases. For ICSID Convention arbitration, the application depends on the date of consent to arbitration. If consent was after July the 1st of this year, then the rules apply by default unless the parties agree otherwise. But note that the administrative and financial regulations uh, that contain certain financial provisions concerning cases, for instance, about uh, advances uh, paid by the parties to cover the costs of the proceeding, uh, they now replace the old administrative and financial regulations with immediate effect on July the 1st. So they now apply to all pending cases. There haven't been many changes there, but you uh, might want to note uh, that they are now applicable to all cases. Now, as you know, uh, the first rule set that applies when you file a request for arbitration uh, under the ICSID Convention are the ICSID Institution Rules. The revised institution rules now are now applicable for all cases submitted to ICSID under the ICSID Convention, except for post-award remedies. Uh, you would apply the 2006 rules for post-award remedies that were initiated under the 2006 rules, and the institution rules do not apply uh, to uh, post-award remedies going forward. In it, convention cases, um, ICSID reviews the request before registration to ensure that the case does not fall manifestly outside our jurisdiction. And this is a standard that is enshrined in the ICSID convention, and the same standard now also applies to um, requests for arbitration filed under the additional facility rules. It's a very high standard and most cases are registered, registered unless it's really, really manifest uh, that something is manifestly lacking jurisdiction. Now to do the screening, um, ICSID needs certain information from the requesting party, the claimant in the proceedings. And we now have a clear checklist in Rule 2 uh, of the institution rules, which uh, lists all of the required information. And you see an example here, which is uh, a description of the investment and of its ownership and control, a summary of the relevant facts and claims, the request for relief, uh, including an estimate of the amount of damages sought, and an indication that there is a legal dispute between the parties arising directly of the investment. So that really goes uh, to uh, the jurisdictional requirements in the ICSID Convention, and you need to include information about that. And this also includes uh, information and documents concerning the instrument of consent, uh, for instance, the date of entry into force of a bilateral investment treaty, 
that's uh, the, the basis of consent in a particular case, and evidence of entry into force of the treaty. Uh, so that is now also on this checklist to clarify what uh, requesting parties need to submit so that there is not too much of an exchange with the Secretariat about information that we need. Next, Institution Rule 3 contains uh, recommended additional information of a request for arbitration, such as procedural proposals, uh, and also disclosures concerning ownership and control of a juridical person who is the uh, requesting party. Uh, often, uh, this is already done in practice, uh, that a requesting party would, for instance, show the group of companies in uh, the same group uh, as the claimant, so that uh, we can check for conflicts of interest later down in the if the case is registered. Now, if you are filing a request for arbitration, I would recommend that you consult our website on how to file a request for arbitration, which has uh, further practical information, uh, including the means of filing, which is now fully electronic under Institution Rule 4. Now, one of the key objectives of the amendments was to reduce the time and cost of proceedings. Everybody complains that uh, investment arbitrations are too lengthy and uh, too costly. And you'll see provisions throughout the rules that address this. It's really a multi-track approach that involves all the part participants. So, for example, there is now a provision in Arbitration Rule 3 that requires all participants to act in good faith uh, and in an expeditious and cost-effective manner. And this is reinforced by an availability commitment by arbitrators at the appointment stage. Basically, uh, they certify that they have sufficient time and availability and that they will respect the time limits in the arbitration rules. Another example is that all documents will be filed electronically, so no more hard copies, and the rules recognize the possibility to hold both in-person and remote hearings. We also have new provisions on consolidation of like cases and coordination of related cases, uh, so you can do that if the parties agree, and that provides a cost-reducing tool and codifies the possibility of uh, merging cases. Also, the rules set out tribunal time limits depending on the type of decision or award. For procedural decisions, like a de decision on provisional measures, it's typically 30 days from the last submission. And the longest time limit is for an award on the merits, 248, so roughly eight months. And that may seem like a, a long time, but it's actually a very ambitious target. So everyone will need to make an effort to enable the tribunal to meet uh, those deadlines. And to do so, the rules encourage proactivity by arbitrators to use the tools at their disposal. So for instance, to propose uh, page limits and to hold case management conferences to identify uncontested facts and narrow the issues in dispute. Also, there are revised rules for extensions of time limits by parties in Arbitration Rule 11 to ensure that requests for extension are timely and can be dealt with uh, without disruption. Now we have revised the arbitrator declaration. It's no longer part of the arbitration rules. It used to be in Arbitration Rule 6. Uh, but now it's an attachment to the rules and referred to in Arbitration Rule 19. Uh, and this is to make it uh, easier to update depending on whether we want to add uh, particular, um, uh, particular disclosure requirements. Now, to preempt possible conflicts of interest, uh, the disclosure form specifically lists uh, particular circumstances such as that 
the arbitrator has to disclose any professional, a business, and other significant relationships in the past five years with the parties, their representatives, members of the tribunal, and any third party funder providing funding for the case. Uh, but also, all ISDS cases which the arbitrator has been involved in in the past five years and any other circumstances that might cause uh, their independence or impartiality to be questioned. Now, with regard to arbitrator challenges, there is a new rule concerning the disqualification procedure, which is Arbitration Rule 22, and which contains an abbreviated calendar for how to deal with a proposal for disqualification. First of all, it contains a clear time limit for filing the proposal. Uh, the challenge can only be filed after the tribunal has been constituted and within 21 days uh, from the constitution the, of the tribunal or from the date when actual or construct, constructive knowledge was obtained of the relevant facts uh, that are the basis of the proposal for disqualification. And this is different from the prior rules, which only referred to that the challenge had to be raised uh, promptly. And as you see here, uh, there are then clear deadlines for comments on the proposal, including the arbitrator's uh, statement with regard to the allegations and a decision on the proposal within 30 days. Now, as you know, under the ICSID convention system, uh, if an arbitrator is challenged, then the other members of the tribunal decide the challenge. That's Article 58 of the convention. And if they're divided or the pro proposal relates to the majority of the tribunal, then the decision falls to the chairman of the uh, ICSID Administrative Council. Uh, now, the revised convention arbitration rules, uh, Arbitration Rule 23, clarify that the un unchallenged arbitrators do not need to be divided on the merits of the challenge for purposes of Article 58. And instead, uh, the, their lack of consensus may be caused by any reason that leads to their inability to decide it. So if they tell ICSID that they are divided for whatever reason, then the proposal is decided by the chairman as under the previous rules. But um, one thing of note is that in the additional facility rules, uh, the challenge is now decided by the Secretary General of ICSID and not by the other unchallenged members of the tribunal. The next rule is um, Arbitration Rule 14, which concerns disclosure of third-party funding. And the way we approached um, third-party funding is that it is relevant for conflict of interest purposes. The rule requires disclosure by the party getting third party funding so that the arbitrators can check whether they have a conflict vis-a-vis -vis the person or entity that is funding the arbitration. The parties uh, must disclose the name and address of the third party funder. And if the funder is a juridical person, the disclosure must also include the names of those who own and control the funder. The obligation covers funds that a party has received directly or indirectly and which are intended for the pursuit or defense of the proceeding through a donation or grant or in return for remuneration dependent on the outcome of the proceeding. So this would include uh, counsel getting contingency fees or a parent company uh, funding its subsidiary, which is a party in the proceeding. And if that parent company is owned and controlled by another person or entity, the name of those must also be disclosed. Now, it will be up to the disclosing party 
to determine whether disclosure is required, for instance, if there are any persons and entities that own and control the funder. Now, it's important that the notice is sent immediately uh, uh, upon registration or as soon as the third party funding agreement is concluded after registration. It doesn't need to have any specific form as long as it includes uh, the relevant information. And this applies to both parties. Sometimes the respondent could also have third party funding. So both parties need to make the disclosure because the purpose is really to prevent any conflict of interest with the arbitrators. And there is a continuous obligation to notify uh, third party funding and any changes uh, to the uh, third party funding information. Now, once ICSID receives the notice, it transmits it to the parties and to the arbitrators for their conflict checking. And as you might have noticed earlier, this is reflected in the arbitrator declaration form so that arbitrators are aware of that they need to include any uh, relevant disclosure. Now, the parties are not required to provide the third party funding agreement or the terms of the agreement if they have funding. Only the name and address and ownership details, if applicable. If the other party requires information about the third party funding agreement for whatever reason beyond conflict of interest, it can request that the tribunal order further information under the rules concerning uh, the production of documents and other evidence. And this is confirmed in Arbitration Rule 14.4, which provides that the tribunal may order disclosure of further information if it deems it necessary. <clears throat> and it's important to note that Rule 14 is intended for conflict of, inf in, um, conflict of interest purposes, uh, and it is not intended to apply to disclosure for other purposes. You can raise that, but not under this rule. Now, while this rule is new, disclosure of third party funding is not uncommon in exit cases, and it is often made on a voluntary basis. So the practice is already there, and it should be a straightforward process under this uh, new rule. Now, the rule uh, on dismissal for manifest lack of legal merit uh, in the 2006 rules now has its own provision and it coincidentally is also rule 41. It used to be 41.5 and now it's the entire provision uh, rule 41. The main addition is that the rule clarifies that uh, an objection can relate to jurisdiction. Uh, this has been established by, by case law so that is nothing new. The objection has to be filed within 45 days after the constitution of the tribunal, and it has to be a full submission. So it has to include all the facts and the evidence relied on. But a party may file the objection even before tribunal constitution, in which case the secretary general fixes the briefing schedule so that the tribunal can deal with the objection once it's uh, constituted. And if the tribunal dismisses uh, a claim for manifest lack of legal merit, there is a new presumption uh, that the prevailing party is awarded its reasonable costs unless special circumstances justify a different allocation. And this is in arbitration rule 52.2, which deals uh, on decisions on costs. So if the case is completely dismissed because there was manifest lack of legal merit, uh, then there is a presumption in costs uh, in favor of the prevailing party. And this also reflects uh, case law uh, where the respondent is often rewarded its costs if all claims were dismissed. The rule on manifest lack of legal merit also specifies that a party may file preliminary objections under the regular procedure 
if the objection does not succeed on, under the manifest standard. And the revised rules contain details rules on preliminary objections and bifurcation in rules 42 to 45. Now these new provisions ensure that preliminary objections and, uh, and requests for bifurcation are raised in a timely manner and uh, are dealt with efficiently following a clear process. So if, for example, a party must notify its intent to file preliminary objections as soon as possible, and this is typically done at the first session of the tribunal so that the tribunal can consider it uh, in the scheduling of uh, pleadings. And sometimes parties also agree on how to deal with bifurcation at the first session, but if they do not agree, then uh, the request for bifurcation of a preliminary objection uh, must be filed within 45 days after the filing of the memorial on the merits. Now, as you may know, under the ICSID Convention, uh, the tribunal has discretion to allocate the costs of the proceeding. And tribunals increasingly do tend to allocate costs to the prevailing party. Now, under the 2006 rules, the award had to contain a decision on costs, but there was no requirement of reasoning or nor any guidance on the circumstances to be uh, considered. So awards were sometimes criticized for deciding on costs with very little or no reasoning. And it was really important to address this uh, so that users would have more clarity and certainty in how tribunals allocate the costs. So that it was what we tried to do in the rules. Uh, the main provision in the convention uh, proceedings in, is Ar Arbitration Rule 52, which is complemented by other provisions. Um, and you can see them on this slide. An important provision in Arbitration 52 is that the tribunal must consider certain circumstances when allocating the costs of the proceeding. And these are based on exit case law. We examined a large number of decisions on costs, and these factors were the most often listed as relevant to assessing costs. So first, the outcome of the proceeding or any part of it. This could be the outcome of the proceeding as a whole, the outcome of certain phases of the proceeding, or the outcome of the particular claims or defenses. The second is the conduct of the parties. Uh, the tribunal should consider in particular whether they acted expeditiously and in a cost-effective manner uh, and that goes back to the uh, general provisions on efficiency in our arbitration rule three. And then the complexity of the issues, and these could be the procedural issues or substantive issues uh, uh, that play a role in assessing this factor. And finally, uh, the reasonableness of the costs claim. Although each party may claim its actual costs, the tribunal awards only reasonable costs uh, consistent with current practice. Now, next is the new provision on security for costs. It used to be dealt with as a provisional measures, but there is now a standalone rule on security for costs separate from provisional measures, which is arbitration rule 53. And it establishes the power of tribunals and committees to decide security for costs. Uh, that is, there is no longer any doubt about that power. And it's no longer a recommendation. The tribunal can actually order security for costs and there is uh, a clear uh, consequence in case of non-compliance. Uh, it can lead to discontinuance of the case after a certain uh, period of time after the tribunal has enabled or allowed the, the, the uh, party that was ordered security for cost to comply with the order. As in the provision on decisions on costs, 
The rule on security for costs provides for certain circumstances that the tribunal must consider when deciding on security for costs. And these are uh, set out in Arbitration Rule 53.3, and you see them here on this slide. It's not intended to be exhaustive, uh, but uh, they should be taken into account. So the first one is a party's ability to comply with an adverse decision on cost. That's in little a. And that really could concern a party in bankruptcy that is insolvent or that is a set up as a shell company without any assets. B is that a party's willingness to comply with an adverse decision on costs. So this rule permits the tribunal to consider whether the investor has structured its uh, business and assets in order to avoid an adverse uh, decision of costs. And uh, it may also look into a history of non-compliance with orders and decisions uh, and payment history um, in, at exit. The little c is the effect that providing security for costs may have on that party's ability to pursue its claim or counterclaim. So that is really the access to justice argument that uh, the party may be impeded uh, from access to justice uh, because it would not be able to put up security for costs. And this factor is also intended uh, to guide tribunals to order security for costs in a balanced way. So, for example, by taking into consideration the reasonableness of the costs for which security is requested and allowing some flexibility uh, with respect to the form of security. Now, D uh, permits the tribunal to consider any relevant conduct by either party so, for example, the tribunal may take into account whether the parties have paid their advances on costs. Now, finally, there is a lot of debate uh, about the role of third party funding with regard to requests for security for costs. And the approach under Rule 53 is that it can be considered as part of the evidence, for instance, to show uh, that a party is impecunious and will be unable to comply with an adverse decision of cost. So it goes to uh, the circumstance in A that I just mentioned, the ability uh, to comply with an adverse deci decision on costs. Now, if the party submits evidence that the audit party has third party funding, then the tribunal must consider such evidence as it would any other evidence adduced in favor of or against security for costs. So in other words, it has discretion to determine the weight to be given to the evidence, to, to the evidence and whether it's relevant. But what is important to note is that the mere existence of third party funding in itself is not sufficient to justify uh, an order of security as there must also be other circumstances um, in favor of providing security. So, for instance, uh, that a, a party is unable to comply with an de adverse decision on costs. And finally, if the tribunal considers that the terms of the third party funding agreement would be relevant to its decision, it may order disclosure of the relevant information under the terms uh, under uh, the normal rules of production of evidence. And this is happening in practice much often, uh, often on voluntary terms. Now, we've also increased transparency in proceedings, as I mentioned before. The parties can still agree on the level of transparency and confidentiality in an exit case, but the default rule is that awards will be published with consent of the parties and orders and decisions will be published with any redactions agreed by the parties. So if there is a dispute about redactions, the tribunal will decide that dispute and ICSID will publish the order or decision with the redactions decided by the tribunal. Now as for awards, uh, if the parties do not consent, we will continue to publish excerpts of awards 
and will consult with the parties about draft excerpts. Now, there is a provision in Arbitration Rule 66 that gives guidance on what would be confidential or protected information, and the tribunal would need to take that into account when deciding on redactions. Now, the rule on non-disputing party participation is similar to what was before, but there is now also a new rule on non-disputing treaty party participation, and that rule allows a state to make a submission on a, the interpretation of the treaty at issue and to which that state is a party. So if there is a bilateral investment treaty involved in a case uh, against a host state, then the other state will have an as of right to file a submission about the interpretation of that treaty. Now, if that state wants to file a non-disputing party submission, that's different. That's not an as of right. It would need to do that under uh, Rule 67, which is the rule with certain conditions for how to um, become a non-disputing party participant in the proceeding. Now, finally, the arbitration rules incorporate a new expedited arbitration chapter, and parties may consent to apply this chapter to their ICSI convention case or their additional facility case, and they could consent to also apply just selected provisions uh, from these chapters, for instance, on how to expedite the tribunal constitution. Now, we followed the expedited arbitration would reduce the time for a case for to up to one and a half years. Uh, we recognize that this is not for every investment arbitration, uh, but it could be useful in particular in investment contract cases uh, involving state agencies. So if there is an arbitration clause involving a state agency, uh, the agency and the investor may choose to refer to expedited arbitration under the ICSID rules. So be open-minded about that for your cases. Even if you don't want the whole chapter applied, you could adopt uh, some of the cost and time-saving provisions to your regular arbitration proceeding. This shows the procedure calendar in an expedited arbitration. There is no bifurcation available, so everything proceeds in one phase. And you could still have document production and provisional measures, uh, but on a faster track. Now, I'd, I'd refer you to look at Arbitration 81 in particular, which also provides for page limits for uh, uh, the party's main submissions, 200 for the first round submissions and 100 for the second round. And the uh, uh, award has to be rendered within 120 days. It's not as fast as a commercial arbitration fast track proceeding, uh, but uh, it is a very reasonable uh, length for an investment arbitration. Now, the additional facility rules have also been updated. And I want to note in particular that the new rules uh, will broaden access to the additional facility. Cases can involve parties that are both from non-ICSID member states. That uh, was not possible before because you always had to have one uh, state or national other than another state that was an ICSID convention member, but now that is not the requirement anymore. Uh, both can be non-ICSID member states. And a regional economic integration organization, an REIO, could also be a party. So there could, for instance, be a dispute between uh, the European Union and Thailand, which is not a member state of ICSID, if the parties consented to use the additional facility. So that's an alternative to institutional arbitration rules when you can't use the convention because of the uh, nationality requirements, for, for instance. And what is good is that you would also get the benefits uh, of similar changes to the arbitration and conciliation as in convention proceedings. 
And importantly, there is no longer a two-step process for starting a case. Uh, you no longer have the approval of access. So the new arbitration rules contain a chapter about how a case is filed, much like the institution rules in exit convention proceedings that I talked to uh, about earlier. Now, there are some differences between arbitration proceedings under the convention and under the additional facility, and you can see the main ones listed here. Uh, and one that I mentioned before is uh, that the ICSID Secretary General decides the challenges to arbitrators instead of the unchallenged arbitrators in ICSID convention proceedings. Uh, also, there is uh, no seat of arbitration in ICSID, whereas uh, in additional facility, the parties themselves can agree on the seat of arbitration. Now, we've significantly updated the uh, fact-finding rules and made them standalone rules separate from the additional facility uh, with their own set of administrative financial uh, regulations. And under these rules, the parties can jointly uh, request a fact-finding committee to determine a procedure protocol and to make specific fact findings in the dispute. Finally, we have also adopted a brand new set of mediation rules. There's a lot of interest in mediation in investor state dispute settlement, and it really responded to a call for more dispute resolution options. And what's important to note is that the exit mediation rules uh, allow broad access to parties who want to mediate. The exit can min administer the case uh, the mediation, as long as it involves a state or state entity or REIO and relates to an investment. Uh, so there are no nationality requirements and provides for broad access to the use of these rules. And another noteworthy point is that the mediation rules are aligned with the formal requirements of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. So the exit mediated settlement uh, agreement can become enforceable. So that was a brief overview of the 2022 exit rules. I hope you will get the opportunity to apply them soon and to benefit from the many improvements to the process. Thank you for your attention and please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. <laughs>